Y'all, we know you love listening because here you are. And we also know that you're crazy busy because you're a parent. We've discovered a super cool new way to get a quick fix of news, parenting tips, or whatever you're into to get your brain moving for the day. It's called Jam. Jam is a new way to share and listen to bite-sized audio. J-A-M stands for just a minute. Each Jam is a one or two minute long audio clip that you can add to a playlist. When you sign up for Jam, you'll have the opportunity to choose and personalize your playlist, adding as many or as few Jams as you want on as many or as few topics as you choose. Listeners can choose from creators and categories such as news, entertainment, parenting, health and wellness, education, and more. Every day at a time of day that you set for yourself, you'll get a text with your daily Jam playlist. Then just click, listen, and learn. I think about my jam as a list of a sort of audio TikTok without all the mindless scrolling, which has been such a better way to start my day. And I actually get my jam playlist in the afternoon to prompt me to get up from my desk and give my brain a break from work while I prep lunch or walk the dog. Whatever the time, tuning into my favorite creators in one playlist has become a favorite way to spend 20 minutes a day. I think it'll become a favorite ritual for you too. Listen and learn with short audio playlists delivered daily via text. Text D-I-J-F-Y to 552266. That's D-I-J-F-Y, short for Didn't I Just Feed You, to 552266 to get jam for free today. Megan, you and our regular listeners know that my younger son Oliver loves to cook and it all started with pancakes. I know he's become the resident pancake and waffle maker in your house. A true connoisseur. It's true. (laughs) He's very serious about pancakes, which is why I wasn't quite sure what he'd make of other world vegan plant-based mixes made with real fruits and veggies. After all, we're talking about a meat-loving 13-year-old here. Banana chocolate chip pancake and waffle mix with cauliflower? He was skeptical. I totally get it. But what's the verdict? What did Oliver think? Megan, he loved it. He loved other world mixes. They are a major win. Guess what? Me and my family love Otherworld, too. My kids are obsessed with the apple cinnamon pancake and waffle mix with added sweet potato and dates, and they offer original and blueberry flavors, both with zucchini and dates. All Otherworld mixes, including the gluten-free version of their original pancake and waffle mix and their gluten-free brownie mix, have no added sugar, no nuts, soy, or dairy, and are made with upcycled ingredients to help tackle food waste. And all you have to do is add water. Or water and oil if you're making brownies and waffles. And cook. So easy. From now until December 31st, Otherworld is offering Didn't I Just Feed You listeners an exclusive 25% off discount. Head to eatotherworld.com and use the code D-I-J-F-Y at checkout. That's code D-I-J-F-Y, short for Didn't I Just Feed You, at eatotherworld.com to get the most delicious deal of the year. Okay, friends, listen up. We're getting straight to the point with this one. We know how to make your holiday shopping way easier. We know that sounds like a big promise, but just like you all, we're busy and the holiday season can be overwhelming. We'd never tease you with a big promise like that and not deliver. So grab your holiday list, count the number of kids that you want to gift, and head to KiwiCo.com. You've heard us talking about how much we and our kids love KiwiCo, and this holiday season, we're getting serious with you. It's time to place some orders. KiwiCo's fun-filled monthly crates include everything needed for screen-free, hands-on enrichment. They bring together creative play, STEM, geography, and even cooking activities in a line of subscription options for everyone from babies to toddlers and teens 16 and older. KiwiCo crates make amazing gifts for the kids in your life, including your own. You know that we're partial to cooking. Lately, our families can't get enough of KiwiCo's Yummy Crate which delivers high-quality kitchen tools, three recipes, and two projects every month geared towards kids ages 6 to 14. And before each crate arrives, you also get a shopping list that includes alternative ingredients to accommodate different diets from vegetarian to vegan. But fear not if cooking isn't the thing that will spark excitement for the kids in your life. Through different seasons, our kids have loved the Kiwi Crate, Atlas Crate, and Tinker Crate, just to name a few. So be sure to check out all of KiwiCo's lines. There's something for every kid. 
So go now. I mean, keep listening to us <laughs> while you holiday shop. Didn't I just feed you listeners? Get 50% off their first month plus free shipping with the code D-I-J-F-Y at KiwiCo.com. That's 50% off your first month at K-I-W-I-C-O.com. Promo code D-I-J-F-Y. Short for Didn't I Just Feed You. And psst. KiwiCo is the perfect gift for last minute gifting too. No shipping or wrapping required. I think I communicated clearly. I was like, Ella and I are in a little bit of a tense moment because I asked her to get off the phone with her friends. And I'm also upset with her because she was playing a game where they're promoting body dysmorphia and disordered eating and and so to both things he was like i think that you're overreacting welcome to didn't i just feed you a podcast about feeding kids hey i'm stacy and I'm Megan. Before we get our, into our conversation today, we wanted to invite you to our Didn't I Just Feed You listeners community. Our free community is where listeners from all over the world come together to ask questions, offer advice, and share favorite tips and recipes with direct access to both of us. We'd love to have you as a part of our supporting membership too. Supporting members can sign up for things like access to our recipe archive or our bonus episodes. We put out two every single month. Visit didn't I just feed you.com backslash community to get all the details on how you can access those. And if you can't join our community or become a supporting member right now, you can always support Didn't I Just Feed You by leaving a rating or a review too. This week's episode is a little different. Stacey and I (laughs) started a conversation just like in one of our regular meetings and hit record on a conversation just between the two of us as moms, as friends. I do want to put a... TW trigger warning on it to say we're talking about disordered eating. We're talking about kids with disordered eating, our own personal experiences. So if that is not for you, maybe go take a look at our archives and listen to something that's going to put you more in a holiday group. (laughs) (laughs) I do. I want to address that because I feel like it might seem like a strange choice as we're gearing up for all these holidays to air this episode. But Didn't I Just Feed You is really about the totality and complexity of what it takes to feed our families. And the bulk of that, for most people, we try to reach as many different people as possible in all the different places where we are, you know, regardless of what you eat, what kind of budget you're working with. For the most of part, we all parents think about it in terms of just churning out dinner day after day after day after day after day after day. Um, So that's why so many of our episodes and morning, (laughs) like a sad and morning. Um, Most of our episodes are just about like cooking and food and tips and recipes and all that good stuff. But we really want to bring our whole selves to this and you know, there something came up in your real life just the other day. Over Crunchwrap Supremes. Over even. Crunchwrap Supremes. And we were talking about it as friends, and it really felt like this was something that we wanted to share with our audience because this is how it happens. You're chugging along and you think everything's fine. And then your kid is like, I want to be a vegetarian. Or you get just, you know, you start feeling anxious about like what they're eating. And you're like, is it really what they're eating or is it me and my issues? Or, you know, you get a new job and something happens. Like these deeper issues around food bubble up and they bubble up at any time. (laughs) You don't always know it's about to bubble up. We should have aired this around Halloween, like bubble, (laughs) bubble, toil and trouble. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I do think that the holidays is a time when eating disorder stuff comes up a lot. It does. A lot of stuff in the in food media about like controlling what you eat and like, how do you not eat too much? And it's so gluten. Like how I've seen literally like, how do you go to that cocktail party and not gorge yourself? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's not what they say, but like, that's what it is. It's like, yes. how do you control your eating? How to enjoy the holidays without getting off track. Yes, there you go. That happens a lot. We're eating with family members. You know, it's not just our immediate families. We're going to grandparents and we're eating around the people who raised us. And sometimes that might bring up issues for us or 
They might start commenting on what our kids are eating. So it just seemed like the it time. Up. It's real. <laughs> like we're, This is what we're going to air. Let's yeah. just do it. Because we do. We try to air as much in real time as we can. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's let's, let's get, jump get into, into it. the recording. <laughs> let's do it. OK, so I had this weird experience with Ella this week, which was Brian and Emmett were at football practice. So it was just the two of us. I was prepping dinner to try to have it be ready for the, when the dudes got home. I went into her room. She's like playing a game with her friend on a they're like doing a FaceTime audio call and then they play Roblox together. And I was like, hey, can you come out? I'd like to know what you'd like in your crunch wrap before I prep it. And she's like, OK. And then she did not come out. So I was like, F- it. I'm just going to make her like a crunch wrap with the things that I think she'll want in it. I didn't do like salsa or sour cream or any lettuce. And when she finally came out, she was like huffy and puffy. She was still on the call with her friend. And they were playing some game because they were they were having a conversation about it. Like her friend on the other line was saying this. Ella was also saying it. They were playing this game in Roblox. I don't know what it was called because I like immediately shut it down and also shut down. But where their objective was to get as skinny as possible. And they were both on a hunt for lettuce because lettuce is the thing that you want to eat in order to get skinny in this game. So there's that like that's a that's a whole subject that we could get into. Like, you know, we're very trust trustful of Ella and the games that she plays. I've I have this is the first time I've ever encountered anything that I found even mildly offensive listening to her play games. I don't think I was I think I was like a little bit like rude to her when I was like, hey, you guys need to stop playing that game immediately. And I would like you to get off your call. In part, I wanted her to get off the call because it was time to eat. And I was already annoyed that she hadn't come out and told well, me what she wanted. It feels like it was probably worth short circuiting that that play or that line of thought that they were yes, traveling yes. down together. And I uh, she immediately pushed back. She's like, Mom, it's not that big of a deal. I don't want to get off my call. And I was like, nope, we're done. And at the same time, Brian and Emmett walked in. So then it's like even more chaotic. Yeah. I serve up Bella's crunch wrap supreme to her. She's like basically refusing to eat it, even though I think of it as like all her favorite things. Like there's refried beans, there's taco beef, mm-hmm. there's like a crunchy tostada, which she likes, mm-hmm. there's cheese, which she likes, and it's all wrapped in a tort. Like she loves a bean burrito, she loves a quesadilla, she loves a cr- So it's like I think it's all the things that she'll really like. And then it beca- it kind of like morphs into. This whole thing also with Brian, which really surprised me. He's like, I think that you're overreacting. And he's like getting snippy with her about not eating. He thought and you were overreacting. He thought I was overreacting. Okay. And come like, sit with us. Pause yeah. for a minute. So she's saying, no, I don't want to eat. What was your behavior that you were doing that he thought was overreacting? Just like getting frustrated with her? I think I communicated clearly. I was like, Ella and I are in a little bit of a tense moment because I asked her to get off the phone with her friends. And I'm also upset with her because she was playing a game where they're promoting body dysmorphia and disordered eating. And and so to both things, he was like, I think that you're overreacting. And you know what's interesting? I do think that for people who aren't in it the way we are, which we are because of the show and because we talk about food and we talk about our relationship with food and because we're women and because this is stuff we grapple with. Sometimes like I have found that putting words on it, which just is a a way of labeling it because we're in it and we're in the conversation, makes it feel like different or bigger to people who aren't in the conversation like Brian. So then when you say something like, I think it promotes disordered eating, it makes it sound like you're saying some like huge, heavy thing. When in reality, you understand disordered eating to mean this pretty wide range of behaviors and eating lettuce certainly fits. Right. Eating only lettuce, right? Like not just like eating lettuce as part of a regular diet. That's what I meant. Yes. And... 
but it probably sounded scary to him to hear those terms, maybe. I don't. Yeah, I didn't get that impression from him. And there's also the other like thing that happened later, even after we talked to Ella, because I continue to be upset. I found the whole incident, even the follow up conversation with Ella, which I felt like went really well. I found it very triggering. I wish I hate that word, but I found it like mm-hmm. dug up yeah. and earthed some of my own feelings about my own disordered eating that made me really emotional. Also, I'm like pre period. So I'm highly <laughs> emotional, anyways. I think it's but a later, pretty emotional thing, but yes. When Brian was like, you know, like, why are you still upset? You're like sitting on the couch crying. I'm like, I have had, I've been dealing with disordered eating since I was 10 years old. Yeah. And there's a statistic, I'll find the source for it, that 54% of 10 year old girls report having dieted or being on a diet currently at age 10. And then that trend continues upwards as girls age. So it was both this thing where it's like, this is a real inflection point for me in my life. And I feel like I already wasted so much time, so much energy trying to fit a diet culture ideal. And I'm so scared of it for Ella. And she's yeah. she's hard to eat right now. Or she's hard to feed right now. Like, she's very picky. She wants a lot of highly processed food. Um, even things that I think are her favorite, sometimes she turns down and yeah. without explanation. And it's and on most nights, it's it's like I can handle it in, internally and just be like, okay, can do you want a bowl of cereal instead? Can totally. you make yourself a peanut butter and jelly? Like something because you need energy for soccer practice or whatever. But especially this night, because she refused the crunch wrap, it was really hard to not be like, are you struggling? Were you worried that she was hungry and choosing not to eat it? Yes. And she did get so upset at the dinner table and then say, can I just have a bowl? Like, I am hungry. Can I just have a bowl of cereal? And I think it was in part because she kind of like refused and then she picked at it so much. And she realized like, oh, part of the reason I'm so upset is because I'm I is also because I'm hungry. But it was like a really weird experience with Brian where he was like, I don't think that statistic is true. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's like from the National Disordered Eating Association. I'm sorry. Is this one of those moments where we get to say like so many people, I'm trying really hard not to make it gender binary because the gender binary doesn't exist, but I'm old. So I don't know. I'm going to just use shorthand here. I hope everyone forgives me. But in my experience as a female identifying person who has also I don't know. It's funny. I don't say that I've had disordered eating. Like that's not something that I identify with, although it might very well be true. But I've definitely thought about my body and my weight since I was 11. Like yeah. 100%. Like how I look in clothes, how I feel, like am I heavy? Am I fat? Like am I chubby? What's the deal? I don't think a lot of men and that probably extends to any person who hasn't grappled with it for whatever reason with body image and food don't realize how absolutely pervasive it is. Yes. Even among people who don't then go on to say, I have an eating disorder, and that's something that's known about them. That there are all these levels of disordered eating and body dysmorphia that I don't know a single peer or girlfriend of mine who doesn't exist on that spectrum of right. have some sort of body dysmorphia. Yeah. And like, have their eating, you know, I don't want to put disordered eating on everybody, but like, and and their eating reflects that at different points in their lives where they're yeah. trying to like control their eating or manage their eating in some way in order to get some, reach some body goal. Like you said, disordered eating exists on a spectrum and even more so in the last 10 years, they're starting to use like the orthorexia label for people yeah. who... Maybe their goal ostensibly is not to lose weight, but to like eat in this like highly optimized way for their health. So I think if you, I'm going to, I'm going to put a challenging thought out here. I think if you eat for any other reason than to just be like satiated, so like you're hungry, you're eating because you're hungry, you're eating what you want to eat. I think if you're eating with like all these goals and parameters around it, maybe you 
have some form of disordered eating. And then I think that 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 makes it like this really big, broad category of people who have that experience. Yeah. And I do want to say, because we we are we are touching on gender identity a little bit, that there is actually a lot of research that is coming out about how hard it is to diagnose disordered eating in men and also people who are fat, who identify as fat, like they can't get a diagnosis, even though it exists in every single body form, gender identity. It's a really, a really interesting disorder. And it that this is the other thing that I brought to Brian is like it's often disordered eating is also often a precursor to other mental health disorders, whether it's anxiety or depression or bipolar disorder, because it, some of it outside of like the cultural implications is also hormone stuff in your brain and like having weird hunger cues. So that's what happened. <laughs> that's intense. <laughs> that's very intense. It's very intense. How did you? resolve it i mean i can tell it's resolve is a funny word because <laughs> it's clearly right, not resolved for you doesn't... how did you close it out with ella so ella and i and brian a little bit who's like cleaning up dinner at this point had a conversation still at the dinner table where she was like i do worry about my body she's like but also i worry about like do you guys love and accept me like those are not her her words but like her general is she yeah generalize I'm generalizing here and so we had this conversation about like you can't always believe everything that you think because we are like we're emotional beings and so sometimes you have to like sit with an I if you're having this thought like nobody in my family likes me they all just wish I would be quiet and go to my room and take up less space to like pause that thought and really think about like okay well they have they provide a safe place for me. There's always food available to me. They come in and invite invite me and include me to be part of family stuff or just check on me. Thinking about those things first, because maybe your mind is telling you something that's not true and you need to remind your mind like, no, I am cared for and I am loved and my family does want me to be included. I mean, so I was like, she's 10. So like weird hormone tween stuff, weird stuff going on with her friends that we talk about. Also, you know, anxiety. Yeah. As someone who has a lot of anxiety around her, (laughs) a kid with an anxiety, a partner with anxiety, it's around the age when it starts to present. Uh, Isaac's first panic attack was, I don't like maybe sixth grade, but like then once it escalated to that point, he doesn't have panic. He's had like two, but like I think he had been exhibiting symptoms of anxiety leading up to it. And that was like a breaking point. And after that, he was like, I am anxious. And then we like got him into therapy, but it was right around like the sixth grade. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, and I'm sure it's informed by your own personal work. Like the idea of talking to yourself about your thoughts comes a lot straight out of like therapy for anxiety and depression. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like stopping the thought, <laughs> understanding that these are the kinds of this is these are the kinds of thoughts that are going to live with you. Like this is who you are. It's OK to be OK with them and then to like stop them and reflect on them differently or to like to have a place for them yeah. to be. That isn't everything I think is right. And I have to believe everything that my brain tells me. Right. But it's true that I do think a lot of eating disorders from what I understand are connected to control and anxiety. And especially if you're an anxious kid, an anxious person, being able to control your food and control your body just feels like such a relief in a world where you feel like so much is out of your control. 100%. And then we also tie, because I was really, at this point, I was still kind of angry, especially (laughs) at Brian, Mm -hmm. because I was like, how can you not think this is a big deal like yeah if she was playing a video game where racist things yeah or homophobic things were being said you he would, would have no problem immediately yes. be like you're done with ipad forever yep. I'm gonna, like yep. smashing it on the ground but because it's like diet culture yeah and he can't relate he was like what and so i did have to say like to both of them i was like diet culture is so deeply tied to white supremacy 
mm-hmm. and like values certain body types as a way to control women. And I don't know where I'm going with that thought, but I did share that yeah. with them where I was like, I'm not just upset because it's my own personal experience. And I find hearing that conversation between two, a 10 year old and an 11 year old really upsetting as part of a game. But it's also because like, I feel so strongly about being anti-diet from a, from a culture standpoint. We've talked about this. It's like, if you make that personal decision and you're not forcing it on anyone, like you're taking care of yourself, that is totally fine. But for like me and my house, well, we're not doing that. I want to speak to the dynamic between you and Brian, because through concerns that I've had over Isaac and his weight and his eating, I've also had similar struggles with my where he'll hear me and he'll believe me, but like he just doesn't get it. And mm-hmm. he's like, oh, yeah, OK, like I'll pay attention. And then he like won't really. And then I'll be like, did you notice like he hardly ate his dinner? I'm feeling really upset. And he's like, what? OK, I don't know. Like, I guess I didn't notice. OK, I'll notice. Finally, I found that I had to sit down with Mike and say, I'm not good at this. I'm good at having an instinct. And I'm good at like helping you see things around food and culture. And, you know, like I know what he's looking at on social media in a way that Mike isn't paying attention to. There's a lot of stuff around all genders and athletics and what your body should look like and how you need to manage your food to reach certain goals that like kids as young as like 14 and 15 are trying. And like, Really, I don't even know that you can start building muscle in any kind of serious way before 15 or 16. Right. You know, hormonally, like chemically. It'd be interesting if our listeners like knew more about that or if we got a guest. I know. I think that's one of the goals for next year, right, is to kind of like get a sports dietitian and someone who can really talk to us about that. Because I think you're right. Like trainer told me. Yeah. If your body's so focused on like growing up, like developing as a into a fully grown human body like how can you have anything extra to expend to bulking up totally as good as i might be at this stuff i'm also clouded and emotional because this is personally triggering yes so what i really i really need us to work as a team and i feel like the minute i ex- like the minute i contextualized it in terms of my trauma and pain and body issues and food issues. It wasn't that he wasn't sympathetic before. It just isn't something that he like thinks about. Like it just wasn't something. And then he realized like, oh, this is about Isaac. And it's also about really supporting Stacy. Right. Because getting into too many conversations with Isaac, I was getting into fights with him because I was highly emotional and I was highly triggered in these moments. And then like we're going at it. And then once we're going at it, I wasn't able to see what's a big deal and what's not. And then I was making certain things a bigger deal. Like I ended up contributing in a lot of ways to the issue because it was so highly emotional for me. Yes. And so I like I really needed to sit down and have Mike understand that I as a partner, like this is serious. I know it's serious. Like, please trust me that we need to help him in some way around food. And then once you get that message, now I also need to take your lead. (laughs) It's like a weird little like dance you're doing with your partner that really, really helped. So I don't know if maybe talking to Brian privately, separate from Ella, and having him understand where you're coming from. And we've talked about this before. Emmett has a bigger body. There's no, like, concerns about his BMI, if if you believe in that or follow that or anything. But even he is, like, sensitive to comments about, like, how close fit. And he, like, one of his, like, YouTubers that he loved she recommended working out for mental health. So like one of the things yeah, you mentioned he's that. bought himself over the years is like little hand weights. Yeah. He doesn't really, you, he really does not like work out besides like going to organize sports, but it's cute that he, like, we think it's cute that he wants to versus like, I wonder if it would look differently if it was Ella, who's like in a very typically straight size, she's very straight size. She's yeah. like right on track 
no matter what she eats or doesn't eat or how much she moves or anything. But like, I wonder if our reaction would be different just based purely on their body types, not their genders. In some ways, I feel very, I feel very pushy as the food person in our house because uh, I also nag Brian about his, like you said about Mike, like Brian is neurodiverse. Eating breakfast is really hard for him. And then he legitimately is a person who like can forget to eat. Like he can have hunger cues and he's like, oh, I should stop to eat. But then he gets like focused in on a project and like will not stop. And then he's like hangry, hungry. So I think sometimes it's hard, like, then I'm already, like, nagging him about that. And then, like, I also need to nag him about how I do. I correct him a lot about, and I feel like that feels bad. Like, I correct him a lot about how he talks to the kids about their bodies or about food. And I think it's because I'm, like, way more sensitive to it. And so I do. I do need to ask him for some help. But your your conversation about Isaac and Mike and the it also bubbled up something else that I want to kind of ask you. Do you feel at all with Isaac like your identity as a food person makes the food arguments and the food control more of a thing like for me sometimes I'm like is Ella being picky because she feels like it's the only power she can have against the person who she feels like controls her the most, which is her mom. I I have definitely wondered to myself. It feels like it can't be a coincidence that Isaac and I argue over food. Yes. Right? Like there is it the, like I'm like, she's too intelligent for us for yeah, her to I not think like, that it's, get that. I think it started uh, I'm making this up. He hasn't talked to me about it. I think it started as a rebellion because I was also much more extreme when Isaac was young. Mm-hmm. I probably did a much worse job with him than I did with Oliver about talking about good foods and bad foods. Like, you know, he's Isaac's the kid that didn't have sugar until his first birthday. No joke. I'm not exaggerating. Like that was yeah. the first time he had I like fully believe cake. you. Um, Isaac didn't have any McDonald's or fast food of any kind, like maybe once by a babysitter. Other than that, I think until he was literally like 11 or 12 years old. Yeah. So. You know, I think that there's a backlash there. And I actually totally get it because you feel like saying it. But like, how blind was I to the fact that like my mother was extremely restrictive and I backlashed (laughs) in the same exact way. You know, I'd go to my dad's house and I'd go nuts. I'd go nuts like sugar cereals, candies, cookies. Give it to me because my mother was so extreme. Carob, peanut butter without sugar. Like that, no, like juice was in the house because parents back then in the 70s didn't seem to understand that juice was sugar water. But, I mean, I grew up in the 80s and I feel like Sunny D was very like prevalent. That. But I thought because I was so much more permissive than her, because it wasn't for me, it wasn't, I don't want you to have sugar or cookies or cakes, which is what my mom did to me. It was, if we're going to have cookies, they're going to be homemade. That was my angle. So I felt more permissive compared to what I grew up in. But now when I look back, it really wasn't like he had a house where there was like never Oreos or goldfish or, you know, he had like Annie's fish. But kids pick up on that stuff that like, oh, there's only certain brands she's buying. Like, why don't I get the goldfish? I am only getting the Annie's. I think it's the same thing. But I'm communicating a value yes in making those decisions and like if they don't have annies then we're not going to get goldfish crackers at all because i won't buy the goldfish brand like why kids pick up on that they go to other people's houses and other people's are like we never have that brand you know i don't think it's conscious i don't think he knows but like i think it's clear and they're smart and so as soon as he could he rebelled And he leaned really, really hard, just like Ella, into processed foods, fast foods. And I don't know, like, you know, it's it's always really tough because those foods are part of life. Go for it. Enjoy it. I like them, too. The thing is that I think when you're young and your brain's still developing, you're a teenager, Like it feels good. It hits all the like fat, sugar, salt, deliciousness. 
like he at the same time as leaning into that as part of his rebellion, kind of lost a taste for, oh, you know, most vegetables. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then it becomes more and more extreme. And now all of a sudden, like you barely eat these homemade meals. And I have said to him over and over and over, I'm not trying to restrict you. Eat everything you're eating. And then also eat more of the dinner that I'm serving you. Eat a like healthier breakfast. Add some vegetables. Like I just want, you know, you put a dinner in front of him that's well balanced and he like eats half of it. And then he's like, I'm full. But leave it on the table. I'm going to come back to it later. And we leave it on the table. I go upstairs to bed. He does go back to the kitchen at 1030 at night. But is he eating? Is he finishing that dinner? No, he's going and rummaging in the, you know, in the snack cabinet. So what started as a rebellion, I think, against food mom (laughs) kind of snowballed into this thing. Yes. And I also think siblings, and I think you guys might have a little bit of the same dynamic brewing also, we do. right? Where siblings also define themselves against each other. And Oliver is the one who cooks and loves to eat everything. And like he likes Wingstop and fast food and Taco Bell, but he also loves like my Brussels sprouts done a certain way. And he's like, oh, you're making broccoli? Great. Can you please roast it with a little Parmesan on top? Like he's that kid. And he's baking and he likes being in the kitchen and he experiments. And so like Oliver takes up that space, which I think makes Isaac lean even more into the like, I don't care about food. I don't want to cook. I just want to order wing stuff. And that's that. Yeah, we 100 percent have that. Like, I think that Ella views Emmett's love of sushi Mm -hmm. as more of an approval because we're, like, more interested in going out to a sushi dinner altogether than, like, begrudgedly doing, like, Wendy's drive-thru because that's, like, her pick. (laughs) It's not even, like, I don't – it just isn't satisfying to me. So there's that. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to add, because you talking about sort of, like, that self – self-fulfilling prophecy of like oh they start to identify as like not the food person and so they lean into like loving all the highly processed foods one of the things that bubbled up in that conversation with ella where she was like i feel like you don't like me etc was she was like i am a picky eater and i was like no you're not a picky eater you eat a wide variety of foods like you're not by any stretch of the imagination a picky eater so like you should stop thinking and operating like that. And that's one thing to say, but it's hard to put into practice. And I think we have been freewheeling with like the processed snack foods and candy and cookies and all that in our house alongside the balanced meals for a really long time. And now it's to the point where, like you said, like she's like, I don't want the Annie's bunnies. I want the like giant box of goldfish. Or I don't want you to stovetop pop popcorn for me and put real butter on it. I want like the fake butter. She literally said she's like, I want the fake butter <laughs> microwave popcorn. Like I that's to all say, I want to eat. I okay. have to say something that I think there might be like a relief in this because yeah. Like it is making me think that there's a developmental aspect to it because, you know, a couple of years ago when I started grappling with Isaac's eating, probably right after we started the show, because early on we did an interview with Jill Castle. And I remember having a revelation on that episode. You guys, you can go all the way back to the beginning (laughs) and listen to like, I think the episode's called like, what's hurting our kids more, sugar or Yes. Parents, something like, like that. Like sugar, the real trouble here. Yeah, something it's like that. It's not what, it, neither of those titles they, are correct, but we can link to it okay. always. But I remember you being at a phase where you're like, yeah, like we just have a bowl of candy out and it's I mean, good. It's not and out. Because, well, <laughs> the, then it was. I remember you being like, there's just a bowl of candy and there are cookies. And like, because it's out all the time, my kids manage themselves and that's just what's normal in our house. And I remember being like, that's what I want. That's what I want. And it hasn't been easy to do that, especially with Isaac. And I always felt like, well, I started too late, like, up. 
is really what yeah. I thought. Like I already f***ed up. So this is what we have to deal with. But, you know, maybe we aren't f***ed up completely. I mean, sure, we we always are. <laughs> like, that's in the some nature way. of parenthood. In some way, yeah. we always if are. Not and, like, this, we have to forgive something ourselves. Else. Something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, there's a developmental aspect to it as well. Probably just the personality aspect to it too. And like, I, I know we're circling back to the like mental health piece of it, but both Ella and Isaac are anxious. Yes. And controlling. Yes. Which perhaps those two things go hand in hand, but I think also it, their personalities, they are controlling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like even on top of the control piece that fits with anxiety, like, I don't know which came first, the chicken or egg, but they're both really into being in control. Yes. And they both run anxious. And it's probably not a surprise then that food, which is a common expression of these things, would especially take root with them given what you and I do. Right. And that's a hard cross to bear. Yeah. For me, it is. But it it's is. also it's like, like what I love. And I do feel like we've given them a gift. You know, the one thing when I get really upset about it, Mike is always like, you know, like, He's going to come back to it. Like you've given him so many wonderful food experiences and you've exposed him to so much. Either he's going to be someone for whom food is not that big a deal and then that's just fine and that's who he is. Or he'll circle back when he's older. And so much of the great food, like knowledge and exposure and experience you've given him will, you know, like be there and will blossom. It's just yes. not now. Yeah. And at the very least, I feel like they're equipped to be fully formed adults. Not that that's like a a marker, but like being able to like go out to a sushi, sushi restaurant, even if it's not what you like to eat and like knowing what to order yes, and like sort totally. of like the etiquette of it. Totally. I think is really useful to them as adults. You know, in the last piece, I will say, you know, Isaac is about to work with a nutritionist. It just got to a point where like we were going back and forth and I didn't know if I was helping. Like I've had a concern recently when he was doing AAU basketball in fall and Mike was like, we just have to like not have you and Isaac be talking about it. Like yeah. that's what it needs to be. And he's just right. Like I did all that I could. <laughs> you know, I had Mike... Mike started to say like a couple like small observations like oh did you eat before the game and Isaac immediately was like not you too like he started to distrust Mike because he thought that I was in Mike's ear and so finally I was like I found a nutritionist who works with athletes and her focus is more performance it's not about like overhauling his diet it's more about thinking about how what you eat impacts performance for workouts, for games, like what to eat before, what to eat after, like how to think about how few food becomes fuel for your, your goals as an athlete. And he was really resistant. And I was like, just have one conversation with her. And if you don't like her, then we won't do it because I know it won't be fruitful if she's not invested. Right. And he had one conversation with her and he really enjoyed it. He really enjoyed it. So he's going to speak with her. So I will say that I do feel like, you know, we can say, oh, it's us and like how we parented and mistakes we made or mistakes we didn't make. I, you know, it can be all these things and they're anxious or they're controlling. But if you do, if you are worried about how your kid eats and that they're not fueling their body in a way that really helps them flourish, and thrive, I do think it can sometimes be worth trying to like get some support. Yeah. A third party. Third party, whether it's kind. mental health or a nutritionist or something. Yeah. Nutritionists I are tricky. A, I had a conversation recently with another friend who's working on getting a like a 504 plan for her son, mm -hmm. which is like for people who have they're like neurodiverse. It's in addition to an an IEP. I mm -hmm. don't know. I'm sure every state Every region calls it something different, but she was like, we're working with a physical therapist. We're also adding a nutritionist. We have like a therapist therapist. So it really is like for whatever your kids are going through, there's so many resources. 
there are beyond odd. just making your podcast co-hosts listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that for me, for me. Yes. Yeah. And like, I feel like we've had a couple of these conversations, like the time where Emmett like over ate and made himself really yeah. sick. And then I was like, am I, am I the worst? I don't feel like I'm the worst. I feel like I'm definitely processing some of my own experiences yeah. while also parenting, like, raising. Yeah. Raising. A- Isn't it cool? No, <laughs> I fucking cool hate it. That we're still humans and raising these other humans. Like, how are we supposed to do this? <laughs> how is this allowed? <laughs> was this, I remember when I, they first let me leave the hospital with Isaac. I remember looking at Mike and being like, is this? like allowed like why are they letting us take this human being home they just are literally like bye <laughs> i'm like i don't know that this is really correct <laughs> that they should trust us with him but okay <laughs> i guess here goes nothing <laughs> yes well i hope that was helpful i do feel like i want to say that i know there are a lot of worried parents out there who may also feel like overwhelmed at the thought of trying to find help or to figure out what help is possible or especially to think about how to pay for said help. And, you know, I don't know what to say because I don't have that many resources and I think the resources are pretty like state specific. Right. But I just want to acknowledge and honor that. I think that, um, I don't know. I don't know what I think. There's always your pediatrician is someone right? who's really helpful and can help you find resources in your community. And I do think I spoke to our pediatrician about Isaac. And if you trust your pediatrician, you can really get a sense of like what's normal and what's not. I will tell you that our pediatrician is not concerned about Isaac. And I have dumped a lot on her and like filled her in on all the things and been like, but, but, but. She's like, yes, he's thin. Yes. He shouldn't eat crap all the time. Yes, he does probably could stand to be fueled by more calories, but like he's okay. Like I promise you he's okay. So that's really helpful to hear. Also, isn't that a little bit annoying? (laughs) It was a little bit annoying and I didn't want to trust her. Okay, I'm just also anxious and like worried. And I tell her like I'm anxious about this. I've talked to her about it twice. And she, she hears me out. I mean, I have a really, I love our pediatrician. And I really, really trust her. So that that is something you can do. And I do think like taking a minute to reflect on how much is your own <laughs> anxiety and your own issues, because I don't think we're alone in this. And just like that can help give you perspective. And I think it comes back to something that we talk about a lot with picky eaters too. Like don't engage in the fight with them. That can make it worse. I know that is easier said than done. But like really thinking about and like whether it's talking to your girlfriends or your pediatrician, first stop and think and get your bearings. Like, where are you in your issues and all of this? What are other people seeing of your kid? Is there anxiety? Like talking to teachers, whatever it is, but just kind of take a moment. And by moment, that can be several weeks or a month. (laughs) Like it doesn't, you know, we're all busy and overwhelmed, but like take the time to really center yourself and like get some perspective on it and then figure out a plan of action that is something other than just like going at it every time you're sort of triggered or worried or anxious about what you're observing and seeing in your kid. Yeah, I think that's all great advice. Uh, I would add there is a hotline like you like there is a suicide prevention hotline. There is an eating disorder hotline. We just did a quick bit of research so that we could give some sort of support and share some sort of support with you guys. It does seem like there are a lot of options via Google. I'm finding one specific for New York City, for New York State, but there is the National Eating Disorders, plural.org, and they also have an online chat that you can get to through their site. They have a phone number that you can call. It's 800-931-2237. And that same number is one that you can also text. Standard text messaging rates may apply. Again, the number is 800-931-2237. 
So Stacey, you shared some resources. Let's also share some resources in the listeners community because yeah, absolutely. even since we talked, I found a couple other resources and I just really like even just talking with you about it. I'm like, oh, it is developmental. It is really helpful to hear other parents and other home cooks like their experience with feeding their family, with feeding other people, because this could be like you're dealing with this with your partner, too, and you don't have kids. Um, so we would love to have you join us there. Our private listeners community is really wonderful and supportive. You can find more information about signing up at didn'tijustfeedyou.com backslash community. And you can also follow us on Instagram where we're at didn't I just feed you. Keep in touch by signing up for our newsletter. A huge thank you to our producer, Samantha Getzik. I'm Megan. And I'm Stacy. Stay sane and well-fed until next time. Be sure to subscribe to Didn't I Just Feed You wherever you're listening. And don't forget to rate and review. With Black Friday savings at the Home Depot, you'll find top brand kitchen appliances with innovative features that can do more so your holidays can be more. Ovens with built-in air fryers for baking the perfect cookies. Dishwashers with smart tech to clean everything from bakeware to festive mugs. And high-capacity refrigerators to keep leftovers fresh. Final day is to shop Black Friday savings and get up to 30% off, plus instantly save up to 750 on select GE kitchen packages at the Home Depot ends November 30th. How doers get more done. Offer valid November 2nd through November 30th. U.S. only. See store or online for details. It only happens once a year. JCPenney's cyber deals are back in store and at jcp.com. Through Wednesday, fill your cart with deals like Yes Please Diamonds and Gemstones now $19.99 each. Or use your coupon inside the JCP app to save up to 50% on small appliances and cookware from top brands like Keurig, Cuisinart, Calphalon, and more. We got your holiday. JCPenney. Offers good on select items through 1130. Exclusions apply. Jewelry excluded from coupons. See store or jcp.com for details.